up for Ed McMahon's Party Machine. <laughs> Tonight, Belle Biv DeVoe. <laughs> Ed McMahon's Party Machine. Yes. Hi guys, how is it going? Happy Friday to everyone. Hope everyone is well. Tonight it's our third installment of our true crime series. And this week's story, I'm gonna try to make this a weekly series, FYI, one story a week, just to keep my other subs happy because not everyone's here for Chantel. Can't say I blame ya. <laughs> She's a lot. And if you're not in, if you don't know who she is, don't even, don't even bother. I don't know what day specifically because my schedule is forever changing. So just bear with me. I will try to get a regular uh, scheduled day. I'm shooting for Monday because I'm generally off that day. Um, but it didn't work out this week because I just didn't get enough research done on this week's subject that I'd like. So I had to put it off till I had another day off, which was today. So anyways, bear with me as we navigate this, this uh, developing of a schedule. <laughs> so without further ado, this week we are going to dive deep into something very interesting, uh, something that is also dear to my heart. Most of these true crime stories have um, some sort of personal impact on me. Um, and this one is no exception. And this week we are going to discuss the none other than great Phil Hartman. Hey, lovebirds. Murphy, you may ask the bachelorette's questions. All right, bachelorette number one, what is your idea of the perfect date? Well, the perfect date would start with a nice meal. We would go to the opera and then go back to my flat for a coffee and chocolate fingers. That sounds great. Bachelorette number two? The perfect date for me would be impossible under existing German laws. <laughs> but a good date would involve a lot of humiliation, a sound spanking, and of course, coffee and chocolate fingers. <laughs> Bachelorette number three? First of all, I would push you to the ground. <laughs> Pee on you, chanting, house on fire, house on fire, put it out, put it out. Then I would force you to drink antifreeze until you passed out. And then you would wake up in excruciating pain with a size 7 poop shoot. Delicious. As you don't know who Phil Hartman is, I'm very sorry for you. Phil Hartman was an amazing com comedian, actor. He did voices on The Simpsons. And he had a very successful career on Saturday Night Live, one of my personal shows, the greatest of all time, in my opinion. If you disagree, that's fine, but we can't be friends. <laughs> Saturday Night Live was just a constant throughout my childhood, throughout my teen years, my adult years, up until now. Saturday Night Live has been everything for me. Don't ever take that show away from me. It is so near and dear to my heart. And... I was lucky enough to see Phil Hartman grace the screen on Saturday Night Live in the 90s and late 80s too, though I didn't really quite get into the show until um, Dana Carvey and Mike Myers and Chris Farley, David Spade and Adam Sandler, they all got on the show. That's when it really became popular. Um, but we're gonna, we're just going to discuss his life and his tragic ending. Like I said, this is a true crime series and what did happen is true crime. Oh yeah. On the early morning hours of May 28th, 1998, he was shot while he was sleeping by his wife in their home. Okay. Just want to paint this picture for you. We got everything. We got Saturday Night Live. We got The Simpsons. We got Paul Rubin. We got The Groundlings. We got surfing. This guy, sex, drugs, rock and roll. We got it all. Okay. We got Jimi Hendrix. We got it all. Okay, this story has everything, okay? So we should start from the beginning. And the beginning for Phil is September 24th, 1948. That was the year in the day he was born. He was born in Brantford, Ontario. So uh, I believe neighbors to Chantel. 
Hey. <laughs> so Phil Hartman, he was the fourth of eight children. Yes, eight children. He There was eight brothers and sisters. He was born to mom Doris and dad Rupert. Rupert was a salesman of building materials and Doris was, as I imagine any woman in the 1940s, a stay-at-home mom. <laughs> Obviously, someone's got to watch all these kids. Am I right? <laughs> there's a lot of them. Okay, now, um, sh spoiler alert, they're Catholic. Who saw that one coming? Am I right? Yes. So, uh, Doris and Rupert kind of had this sense of bougie to them uh, when Phil was really young living in Canada. They tried to present themselves as upward mobility and um, most people saw right through the act but god help them they sure tried to put their best foot forward try to look the more presentable like they had more money than everyone else i mean they had all these dang kids so you know money's gonna be tight the more kids you have the less money you're gonna have to <laughs> put around towards the finer things in life am i right but anyway so doris and rupert had this dream of moving to California. They dreamt of sunshine and surfing and all that stuff. I mean, I guess Canada was not it <laughs> for them. A little chilly, it's my guess. So, but it took them a good five years to get that act, um, get that dream into actual form of action and they did eventually move to Southern California when Phil was about 10. Now they did move around a little bit in the beginning. They kind of migrated their way down. Of course they made a pit stop in Maine. Don't know. Don't ask. I'm not sure. But they did eventually make their way down to Southern California where Phil would grow up and spend his childhood surfing and doing the typical California boy things. Um, and he attended Westchester High School, where he was considered Shocker, the class clown. I mean, he is gonna eventually be on Saturday Night Live. It only makes sense to be this a class clown, am I right? Yes, yes, definitely. But, um, you know, Phil Hartman was a pretty, pretty likable guy. After he graduated, he attended Santa Monica City College where he uh, studied art. However, he did drop out in 1969 and he became a roadie, which I think is personally awesome. Uh, 1969 being a roadie, hell yeah. Um, I'm down. I, w I would totally support that career change. <laughs> I support that. So he was a roadie for the band Rockin' Foo. I've personally never heard of them, but that's who he <laughs> He was a roadie for. I guess they were some sort of psychedelic kind of rock band. Anyways, like what band in 1969 was not psychedelic <laughs> in a little bit, you know, going through a phase. Um, <clears throat> but fun story about this is one night when Rockin' Foo was performing, Jimi Hendrix was in the audience. And Jimi Hendrix came up on stage and started rocking out with Rockin' Foo. And I mean, it was a rockin' foo good time, you know what I'm saying? And Phil was like, holy shit, Jimi Hendrix. I mean, he was probably fanboying a little bit. I would have been fangirling hard. So ain't no shame or blame in fanboying for Jimi Hendrix. My God, that is rad. Anyway, so that, that was Phil's life. Like, no, no comedy, no real acting, no nothing like that, but, um, you know, just, just living the rock star life, you know, as a roadie. Anyway, so in 1970, he would meet and marry his first wife, first of three. This man's been married a couple times, so I'll get into that in a minute here. But his first wife's name was Gretchen Lewis. Now, he met her, they fell in love, they got married, and Phil did what Phil does best after getting married. So he is the kind of guy, he is... He is enamored by you in the beginning. Like he just can't get enough of you. You're everything to him. And so you guys get, you fall in love and it's this whirlwind romance and oh my God, it's amazing. And poof, he's like, he is just disconnected from you. He is, 
he's like telling you, you need to do your own thing. You're getting too clingy, blah, blah, blah. And he just shuts down emotionally. That is his shortcoming. That is Phil Hartman's shortcoming. He will sweep you off your feet, but then he will go cold. So amazingly, this marriage did not last very long, okay? It lasted two years, two. That's it. That was bye-bye, we done, we out. Nice knowing ya. <laughs> so, but in 1972, Phil decided to go back to school and study graphic arts, which actually paid off for him really well because he ended up starting his own graphic art business where he designed album covers which I thought was really cool. And some of his customers were Poco, America, and Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Now he did over 40 album designs, so I'm pretty sure you could find an album in the 1970s and that's got Phil's handiwork all over it. So I guess this guy, the one he was the one that was, I think the most famous, and I can't remember if it was Poco or America. but it was like an outline of a horse. And um, I think that was like his most famous and it was just a very simple and he drew it himself. Like the guy was pretty good at art. He was pretty artsy fartsy, okay? He could draw. So that's, that's really cool. Good for Phil. <laughs> and Phil got hooked up with that through his brother, by the way, who actually did work and I believe in the record industry. So Phil kind of broke in like through family, family ties. So, you know, family hooked him up, which is pretty sweet. You know, he's just, he's just enjoying life, you know, probably smoking some weed. Now, Phil didn't have like, not that I could find any sort of real addiction to drugs and alcohol. Like I'm sure he like drank socially and smoked weed. Maybe he did some cocaine here and there, but you know, no, no real, drug abuse in Phil's story. So just remember that a dude on Saturday Night Live who wasn't doing cocaine in the bathroom, what? <laughs> really? Yes, yeah, sure. I was, I was unsure. <laughs> um, anyway, so this um, incident happened. Now I can't remember the name of his friend and I, I searched, I heard the story, I swear to you guys. It's like one of those things. I heard it three times and I thought the story was amazing. And then when I went back for details to make this video, poof, I can't find it anywhere. Story of my life, am I right? If I do end up finding it, I will insert this his friend's name into this part. But as of right now, I can't remember who this friend is. So anyways, Phil and his friend actually ended up taking like a little boys trip, little getaway up to Mammoth uh, Lake, California. I believe it's like a, uh, geothermal lake and um so they were out in this lake and there was like a bunch of people out there but the thing was is that it was so there was so much steam coming from the water that his friend said you can't you couldn't even see your hand in front of you so no one could see each other so there's all these people out there in this lake and I guess it's at night and everyone's just relaxing and enjoying it, you know, taking it all in. I'm sure it's so relaxing. And Phil starts doing what Phil does best and he starts doing impersonations. He was doing John Wayne, you know, these like old, he had a real deep love of 1940s old Hollywood. So he's doing all these impersonations like John Wayne and everyone is just like silent listening to him. Like all you can hear is Phil Hartman's voice coming out of the steam basically just doing all these impressions for like hours. And at the end, his friends like, ladies and gentlemen, that was Phil Hartman. Remember that name. <laughs> I just loved that story. I always make people laugh. Like I made people laugh in high school. Like, I don't know. People like to be around me. People think I'm fun. Maybe I should try some comedy and see what happens. So he starts taking classes at a club, um, at a place called the Groundlings in Los Angeles. Now, a lot of people have been discovered out of the Groundlings, like Sherry O'Terry, Will Ferrell, Julia Sweeney, just to name a few. They've been discovered through the Groundlings, which is just this comedy club in Los Angeles. Um, it's not. It's not quite like the comedy store, but you know, it, it's put out some talent. And he one night got up onto stage and, and he just, everyone was like, holy shit, this guy's amazing. He's, he's funny, he's versatile. And he had this thing, he had this gift with people in, um, in the groundlings. Like he would, 
he would really make you look good. Cause you know, it's improv. I am not someone who can do improv. It's just not my thing. So I really respect people who can do it because I think it's just this amazing gift. And not only could he do it so well, but he would also just make you look great. So like if you were just choking, he would rescue you, you know, like he would be the person I'd want to work with if I ever lost my mind and thought, hmm, I think I'll do improv. Like that's a good idea. <laughs> that should work out just fine for me. I would love to have a Phil Hartman there helping me out. <laughs> so he was, <clears throat> so he was pretty loved. He was really popular there and he did eventually actually join the cast of the Groundlings. And so he was like a headliner there, like he was big. And when he was there at the Groundlings, he met this guy named Paul Rubin. Paul Rubin, AKA Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> this beloved 80s character, personally watched Pee Wee's Playhouse as a kid, loved it to death. And I had no idea that Phil Hartman had a hand in Pee Wee's Playhouse. That was, that was very mind blowing to me. I was like, what? So Phil's car, um, character on Pee Wee's Playhouse was Captain Carl. <laughs> Gonna smoke, eh? Yeah, whatever. Can I light it for you? No. Why? Because. Because why? Because I said so. Well, I did say so. Because. Because why? Just because, no! <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, you pesky little barnacle. <laughs> Hartman also wrote uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, the movie <laughs> about Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> Pee Wee Herman and his bike. It was at the Alamo in the basement. <laughs> For those of you who didn't ever see the movie, Alamo in the basement. So he helped write that movie. Now, a couple of things about it. Um, he was kind of concerned for Paul Rubin. Like he didn't want Paul Rubin just to be known for Pee Wee. Like he wanted to see, cause him and Paul were close. They were, they were good friends. You know, they worked together, you know, they were, they work buddies. They liked each other, you know? So like what friends do is what friends do. And what Phil did was it's like, Hey, I don't want you to get stuck and be like just this one type and you can't be versatile and be anything other than Pee Wee. Like, I don't want that for you. And Paul, Paul was just kind of skating off the, the fame he was acquiring from Pee Wee's Playhouse, so I don't think he was really trying to hear it. Now, Paul Rubens actually did try to audition for Saturday Night Live in the 80s, and they passed. Um, now, funny thing about Saturday Night Live is during the mid-80s, it was coined Saturday Night Dead because Saturday Night Live was on its last legs about the time that Phil Hartman joined the cast on Saturday Night Live. It was on its last leg. It was, people thought it was for sure gonna go off the air. It just, it was nothing. Like Lauren Michaels left for a while. Um, and Lauren Michaels, who's like the producer of Saturday Night Live, he's like one of those people that I would give anything to just sit down with him and have lunch with and just like get an hour of his time just to talk to him. Like, I have so many questions I'd love to ask. Like he is just the most intriguing person in my opinion out there. Like he's just, he's always just under the radar, but he's been a part, he's had a hand in so much success and so much of my childhood and my my teen years and like with Wayne's World and, and the Gap Girls and, and all, you know, all of it, all of Sarnet Live, you know, just all the sketches, the, the presidential debates and comedies, like everything. He's been there through it. And it, he's just like this person that's just like, like, I don't mean to sound dramatic, but he's kind of responsible for my happiness. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he has kept me entertained for years and I would give anything to just sit down and, and just talk to him about his, his experience being a producer on that show. So, um, but anyways, I'm gonna back up just a little bit, but just to let you know, like I, I always have a hard time imagining Saturday Night Live sucking. <laughs> I know people say, oh, it's not funny. I'm like, eh, it is, it's funny. Like I can always find something good out of every episode. Like I can find a sketch that's just chef's kiss. 
they, they've cranked out some good stuff. Like maybe not everyone is gonna be a, a winner, but dude, <laughs> I respect the craft. <laughs> Okay, like you have to respect the hustle that goes in behind Saturday Night Live. Like, let's just go on a tangent for a minute. Like they basically have one week to get all of it together and they are just working like crazy people and then they put it out there and it's just like a train wreck, a dumpster fire on the train, just going 120 miles an hour careening down the street and it's like deadlines 11.30 Saturday night and you're live. Like I respect the craft, okay? <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure not every single one's gonna be a winner. <laughs> like, let's let's cut them a little bit of slack. <laughs> Ride or die for Saturday Night Live, that's me. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> if you guys want a story time, let me know. Because um, I've actually been to Saturday Night Live live. I've seen the show. I've seen, I, I literally... I know this sounds creepy, but I literally could not take my eyes off of Lauren Michaels walking around with his crackers. I was like, oh my God, it's that guy. <laughs> like in between, like during commercial breaks, I'd watch him walk around. I was just like, I, I was just like, I can't believe I'm in this room right now. This is crazy. But if you guys want a story time about my experience being selected to be in the audience for Saturday Night Live, because this was back in April, 2017 that I actually went to see the show. Um, and I haven't entered since because I want other people to have the opportunity. Like, I don't want to take my entry away. <laughs> but um, I literally did win. So let me know if you'd like to hear that story because it, it's one of those high points in my life that I, I would be happy to relive. And even if you don't want to hear it, I might just tell it to you anyways. So you might as well just agree. <laughs> anyways, back to Phil. Phil's who we're here for, am I right? So around this time, so around the Pee Wee's Playhouse, about the time he's about to, um, he's about to uh, audition for Saturday Night Live, he meets his second wife, wife number two. And her name is Lisa Strain. Now I like Lisa because she had these bangs. Oh, I love her. She's cute. I wish he would have stayed with her. It's pretty much the same song and dance like it was with Gretchen. You know, he meets her. He's like, oh my God, she's amazing. I love her so much. Blah, blah, blah. Let's get married. They get married. And then he's like, <laughs> he's just emotionally checked out. That's Phil. <sighs> so they get divorced and they divorced. So they got married in 1982 and they divorced in 1985. Phil Hartman would join the cast of Saturday Night Live in 1986. So that's where we're at. Saturday Night Live was on its way out. It was on the fritz. And Phil Hartman ended up getting a nickname called The Glue because he was the thing that kept the show together. Now, things about Lauren Michaels would say about Phil Hartman was like, I didn't even have to show up. Like, if Phil was there, everything was fine. Phil was is just like one of those versatile people. He could just do anybody. Like he did he did Bill Clinton and I will I will insert clips throughout because we have got to appreciate his work on Saturday Night Live. There's so many great things he did. They come up on the screen and you just you just knew. You knew you were going to laugh. That was Phil. He was just he was special. Um and so he really him and the other castmates they they got Dana Carvey, John Lovitz, um, Victoria Jackson joined and then Julia Sweeney and eventually David Spade and Chris Farley and all these guys ended up joining this show and it just it just took off and became a major hit and just this I mean in high school Monday we'd always be talking about the latest sketch we'd be doing gap girl imitations or living in a van down by the river or Bill Clinton's I feel your pain all of it, you know, just, they were always doing something. Wayne's World, part of time, excellent. You know, we just, all of that was just going on during high school for me and Phil Hartman was there at the helm. And um, it felt like he was in every sketch too. And like, fine by me, <laughs> you know what I mean? 
<laughs> it was fine. I loved it. He was just great. Um, there was just something about that cast that is just so amazing and wonderful and just brings back so many memories. I love rewatching old episodes from the 90s. It's just... <sighs> You know, if you grew up and went to high school in the 90s like I did, class of 96, woo -woo, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you have, you might probably have quite the love for Saturday Night Live too. I mean, it was just major. So probably about 1986 or so, he meets Bryn Omdahl, his third wife, his last wife, Bryn. Bryn is pretty. Something about her to me when I see pictures of her, there's something that kind of seems off about her. I mean, when I saw pictures of her back in the day when, you know, like, you know, Getty photos, you know, he'd be on an event or something with Bryn and I'd be like, oh, that's his wife? Oh, it's not what I was expecting. I don't know why. But I just, I thought I would throw that in because it was something I felt like it was worth mentioning. So anyways, people weren't really a fan of Bryn. She was kind of, she, so Bryn, <clears throat> before she dated Phil, she dated Rob Reiner, <laughs> the director. Yeah, she's kind of like, she came from Minnesota and she, she's very pretty. Yes, she's pretty, but there's just something about her. No offense. I'm sure she's great, as great as she could be. Um, so when she met Phil, she, you know, Phil kind of fed her some bullshit story of like, I'll get you famous. <gasps> that would never happen. And she resented him for that. Now, like I said, people weren't a fan of Bryn. They, they fought a lot. She had substance abuse issues. She had depression. She had problems with depression and anxiety. She drank and she did a lot of cocaine. Um, actually, one of the writers remembered a time when Bryn was in the bathroom doing lines and offered her lines, which she said, I know that might sound jarring, but this is Saturday Night Live. Everyone's doing cocaine. It wasn't that bizarre, but that was her. She would be in the bathroom at Saturday Night Live doing lines. So Bryn really tried to make a career for herself, like an acting career. She did do some modeling. She did some like ex some work as extras on some movies and shows, but nothing big. In fact, in the opening credits on Saturday Night Live, you can actually see her. Phil's sitting in a diner and there's a blonde woman and her earring is swinging back and forth. That's Bryn. Bryn was told to just face dead on. She wanted to look at the camera and the cameraman's like, no, just look at Phil and Phil makes eye contact and you see her earring. <laughs> like I said, he's emotionally shut down and that really bothered her. Like he just wouldn't, he would just go to bed and go to sleep. Like that was his thing. Like if they were fighting, he would just go to sleep. Like That's it. We're not doing this. Um, and that pissed her off to no end. So, <clears throat> so anyways, all through, so as time goes on and Phil's career is really taking off, he's getting really famous. He's starting to do some movies. He did movies like Sergeant Bilko. Bryn's, nothing's really happening for Bryn. So all that they're really doing is fighting and Bryn's complaining that he's working all the time and she's stuck at home. They, they had their first son in 1989, Sean. So Sean was born in 1989. Phil was about 41 years old at this time when he finally had his first child. Um, and he loved Sean, he loved his children. And then his second child, uh, Bergen, was born in 1992. He had a really nice house in Encino. He had an apartment in New York, hello, he's working on Saturday Night Live, like dude needs a place to crash. <laughs> and his favorite um, destination of all time was Catalina Island. Like he loved to sail over to Catalina. That was like one of his favorite things to do. Another, just to give you an idea of what Bryn was like, she was also a very jealous woman. Uh, when they had their first son, her um, Phil's ex-wife, Lisa, wrote a letter to Phil and Bryn and Sean, just, you know, being gracious and saying, hey, congratulations, wishing you the best. You ever need a babysitter, let me know. You know, it's something that you just be like, oh, that's nice, thank you. No, 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 Bryn, <laughs> Bryn did the most 
extra thing you could ever do, which is send her back a two page letter threatening her going off just being like don't you ever da, 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 blah don't da, da, I'll come for you bitch who do you think you are you know just you know imagine getting a letter like that being like oh, <laughs> well <laughs> excuse me <laughs> So she, of course, confronts Phil about it and feels like, oh man, you should have seen the other letter she wanted to send. That was the tame letter. Like, Phil, really? In 1994, Phil leaves Saturday Night Live and I was butthurt. I took that personally. I felt personally attacked when he left the show. I was like, how dare you? You didn't run that by me first. And he moved on to a TV sitcom called News Radio. Um, I'm gonna be honest, I never really watched the show because that's how butthurt I was about him leaving Saturday Night Live. I know, hell have no fury as a woman scorned. <laughs> I will not watch that show. <laughs> I'm not joking, guys, I was butthurt. I was butt hurt. Don't forget the fact that there were many other great people on that show, but you took Phil away from me, how dare you? No, I will not watch your show. Anyways, but he he had a he was like this arrogant um, news or this arrogant DJ on the radio, and it was a great show. Like the show was a big hit. Like it, it did well. Lots of my friends watched it. Like I, I, there was arguments constantly. Like, did you see news radio? No. You need to watch the show. It's so funny. Mm, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it was good. I'm still butthurt. <laughs> can't do it. I can't. You've betrayed me, Phil. <laughs> How dare you? And television show, he's also doing The Simpsons. He did Troy McClure on The Simpsons and Lionel Hutz, the lawyer. And who doesn't love Troy McClure though? You may remember me from movies such as when he wasn't doing that he was on his boat or on his plane or driving his Bentley around you know not really spending time and I'm sure Bryn was very resentful and very angry and I'm sure it was all very a lot for her too we're moving closer to 98 so I think we'll go to about 97 which um Chris Farley actually died in 1997 in Jan um, December of 97 from a drug overdose and um for phil and bryn at that time bryn had been sober for a while and actually i think 97 was actually going pretty good for them i think they were getting along pretty well bryn was sober she kind of had her depression in check she was taking zoloft um so everything seemed to be going great until they went to a christmas party in 97 andy dick was there and andy dick apparently gave Bryn some cocaine. Now, John Lovitz blames Andy Dick for Phil Hartman's murder. It's kind of, kind of intense. <laughs> it's a little intense. Um, me being someone who's in, you know, who's a former addict, like you can't blame the people for giving it to you. Like if you're gonna, if you're gonna do the drug, you're gonna do the drug. And whoever's got it is the one you're gonna get it from. It's just how it goes. It's like if, if it wasn't Andy, it would be someone else at the party she would get it from because that's where her head was at, obviously, because she relapsed. So, so Phil was very upset with Andy too at the time. Like, dude, she, she'd been sober, things were going good. Like we're actually getting along and <sighs> you gave her Coke, how could you? And Andy's like, my bad. <laughs> like, <laughs> like Andy's not my favorite person but I, I don't blame him for this sorry I'm just gonna go out on a limb of course I wasn't there I don't know but based off of all the information I've read about the situation I don't really think it's fair to put all the blame on Andy it's more Bryn's responsibility like you're you're in charge of what you put in your body Andy didn't put it in your body you did the person you need to be upset with is Bryn so I guess Bryn goes back, tries to go to rehab and all this stuff. And like, it's just not, it's not working. Like she's just drinking. She's just worse than ever out of control. Stop taking her meds and then start taking her meds again, which is important. 
Um, and a month before Phil's murder, his dad actually dies, which is really sad. May 27th, 1998. Bryn goes out to dinner with a friend at Buco de Beppo's, just down the street from her house. Like I, I feel like it was like a quarter of a mile from her house. And she meets up with a friend. She has some drinks, nothing big. Um, it's having a good time. And then Bryn goes over to her friend's house, uh, Ron Douglas. And she's over there at his house. I think she has a few more drinks maybe. And they're talking and all this stuff. And nothing really seems to be out of the ordinary. Like everything seems to be okay. And I think Ron says something to the effect like, well, give Phil my love when she left. And so she leaves to go back home. And now by this time, it's May 28th. And we're not sure what happened but pretty much sure that they got into an argument and Phil went to sleep because that's what Phil did. They fought, he went to sleep. That's how he dealt with it. He didn't talk about things. He just, he shut down and went to sleep. That's, that's frustrating. I get it. However, hmm. But what happened next? It's like Bryn snapped. That's the only way you can put it. I don't know. No one's really sure what caused this break for her. If it was the drinking, if she was on, because they did find that she had cocaine in her system at the time of her death, or if it was the Zoloft. SSRIs work, and sometimes they don't always work the greatest. So it could have been a combination of those things that caused her to break. But she grabs a gun, shoots Phil in the head, and Phil is dead. I mean, he died immediately and he probably was asleep. Actually, he probably was asleep. So he probably had no idea what happened. It was just like went to sleep and that's it. So Bryn is tripping the fuck out. So she goes back to Ron's house. She's like pounding on the door. And now she's in even a worse state than she was than when she left. Like he said, she was just slurring she was just bad like he was pissed at her he's like what the fuck are you doing what are you doing back here where's phil where's your kids what's going on and she had actually brought the gun with her back to ron's house and so she shows ron and ron's probably like no doubt like what the fuck did you do what did you do she's like, i shot phil and he's like no you didn't there's no way you shot phil you're making this up you're imagining things and she's like i did so she and him go back to the house and he goes inside the house and he goes into the bedroom and he sees that, oh yeah, she shot him. He's dead. Now, Ron calls the cops. Now about this time, it's probably about close to six in the morning. The kids are still in the house. I don't know if it's never mentioned, like did Ron think to go grab the kids or what? But while he's calling the cops, Bryn locks herself in the bedroom. He's on the phone with the cops saying, Phil Hartman's dead. Yes, she's here. She's locked in the bedroom. And the police arrive and there's like a standoff at the house. And the next thing you hear is a gunshot. Bryn shoots herself and she's dead. We begin with a murder investigation that has stunned the entertainment world. Phil Hartman, who gained fame on Saturday Night Live, was found shot dead in his home, apparently killed by his wife, who then committed suicide. ABC's Carla Wool has more from Los Angeles. At 6.20 this morning, residents of this upscale Encino neighborhood called police to report gunshots coming from the Hartman's gated estate. Officers arrived to find a nine-year-old boy and a six-year-old girl by the front door, both obviously upset. As they were taking the children out of the house, officers heard a gunshot in the master bedroom. There they discovered comedian Phil Hartman dead. Authorities say it appears his wife Bryn shot him, then turned the gun on herself. Mr. Hartman had been dead for a while. He did not die um, at the same time that uh, Mrs. Hartman apparently killed herself. Distraught neighbors and friends of the couple say they had marital problems. One woman said she had feared that this would happen. We don't have any information concerning that topic at this time. We're continuing. Robbie Homicide will conduct a very thorough investigation. They will talk to the neighbors. They will talk to all witnesses and try and, and find that out. 
Hartman made his living making people laugh. He got his first big break on Saturday Night Live. For eight years, he took on characters like President Clinton. And the fact is that one person and one person only bears the full responsibility for this affair. My wife, Hillary Rodham. Hartman was currently starring on the NBC sitcom no, News Radio. He played a Ted Baxter-ish anchorman. <laughs> Police are not confirming it, but friends say it was the Hartman's children taken from the house. They are now in protective custody and are being questioned by police. Carla Wohl, ABC News, Encino. I remember at this time, we were all still recovering from, from Chris Farley. So when this happened, it was like, what the fuck is going on, man? Shocking. What happened to the children? Well. I feel like I, I would do them a great disservice if I didn't brag on Phil's behalf of their kids. You know, do a little little bragging for the parents. Um, the kids are doing great. The kids are doing actually quite well. Uh, Bergen actually made an appearance on SNL's 40th anniversary. Um, so that was really cool to see her. She's she's gorgeous. She's stunning. She's She's married, she's graduated college, she's doing really well. She does actually, it looks like she did have a little bit of trouble with substance abuse, but it looks like she's actually been able to maintain some long-term sobriety, so good for her. Um, his son, Sean, he's doing really well. He's he's um, trying to be, a, I think he's working on being a musician of some sort. He went to college. The kids actually ended up moving in with um, Bryn's sister, which was, the wishes of both Phil and Bryn. It, it was in the will, like Phil wrote it out. So they, they did it. And we have to remember that family didn't do it. So I think it was hard on everybody. The kids' names were changed, but you, I'm not gonna put anything out there that isn't already out there. Like I'm not gonna disrespect kids like that. But Bryn's um, on, Inst or Bryn, um, <laughs> Bergen is on Instagram. She doesn't post a lot, but she does, she does, she is there. Um, and she seems to be doing very well. She just got married in Italy in 2018. She's just gorgeous. Like her dress is beautiful. Like you have to see it. Um, yeah. And I think Sean just kind of stays off social media. So there's a couple pictures you can find online if you're really curious, but there's not much on him, which I think is great. You know, keep a low profile. Um, but they seem to be doing okay. Like, of course, we can never really know what that night did to them or how badly that affected them because um, they were present when this all happened. So, um, yeah, so there you have it. He loved his kids with all his heart. He loved his children. You know, he loved, he just, he had, he was so optimistic about his future. He was looking forward to future projects. Like, he just was, he was not done like his his he wasn't done yet and it this was all just taken from it. it was taken from their kids like their relationship with their father and their mother like it was all just taken away and it's just so tragic that that drugs and alcohol just destroy destroy lives and families the way it does it's just uh he's just an amazing person and we are lucky to have gotten to share him for a period the short period of time that he was with us and so I don't think there'll ever be anyone quite like him, ever. <laughs> Maybe it's time to put the salty bitch down and, and watch the news radio and like, you know, like if it was good enough for Phil, it should be good enough for me. <laughs> Cause I already know what I wanna do for the next next week's true crime. I don't wanna give you guys a hint. Like I really wanna tell you, but I'll just be like bow chicka bow wow. <laughs> and that's your hint. <laughs> Staying alive. Staying alive, ah, 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 staying alive. Is that gonna help you at all? Probably not, but I'm really excited. I am looking forward to the next week because it just came to me while I was doing all this research and I was like, oh, ooh, good one. No one talks about this one. That's me, I'm trying to find topics that no one talks about. So stay tuned for that. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, everyone have a good night. And for all my recovering brothers and sisters, if anyone hasn't told you today, I'm very proud of you. I love you. Everyone take care. Stay safe. And just be good. Make good choices. <laughs> all right. Love you. Bye.